You talking to me? You talking to me? It's are you talking, talking to me? You. Are you talking to me? Wait, which one are you talking to? Because there are two people here. Are, are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Where? You must be. You must be. What, well, we're trying to help. Are, well, are, are you on, talking sorry, to I'm... your significant other again? Through uh... Sorry, no, I, no. I was on Facebook talking to someone else. I wasn't talking to you. No, I thought you were talking to me. I thought... oh, no, I was talking on Facebook. Hell no. <laughs> and <laughs> I just wanted to see how we would react to that. Anybody... Well, there, there's nobody here. But so I wasn't talking, talking to, you. to me. So you must be talking to me. What's the matter? Can you talk, talk, talk? Talk, talk, talk? I don't see anyone here. <laughs> so you must be talking to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just had to do that because that's his most quotable line. It's just weird. Oh, it's all over the fucking place. <laughs> there can be only one. They're here. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtay, for another glorious episode. Uh, first up, we'll introduce to you to, um, to the, all of my two of um, my co-hosts here. But uh, just so you know, we're going to talk about Robert De Niro films. Uh, the great Silver Silver Fox actor, you know, he's he's a legend in the Hollywood. Silver but, Fox? What? He, what he's got silver hair sort of, you know, he's got gray hair. Oh, what? Yes. Can I call can I call him a silver fox? <laughs> <laughs> Not much of a fox. Hey, hey, come on, the elder ladies love him. Come on. Give him some love. Mm-hmm. Uh, first up on the roster is James Sullivan, also known as Hami Dude. Two Nights Broadcast is brought to you by our final podcast for the month of January. The weather sucks, too many people are getting sick, our animated movies are off to a bad start, and our politicians are even worse. Rest in peace to all the celebrities who died this year. Screw this month. I'm ready for spring. Woo's with me. Oh, wait. Grease Live. I am... I am. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. What, a, what a crappy month this has been. Oh, yeah. It started off terribly. Yeah, we'll see how the rest of 2016 goes. And last but not least, uh, the Canadian uh, known as Matt Bruneos and as Anna Matt. All right. So for tonight, I'm going. Well, I just want to let you know two things. One, um, I have a bit of a sore throat, but I'm going to be fighting for. I'm going to be like fighting it now, and like to actually do the podcast. And two, I want to present you guys some of my ex- some of my great acting skills. <clears throat> I'm a duck. You know, I, I go quick. You know, I, I like to swim in ponds, and I, I like to eat bread. You know, when when people come in, you know, they they, they give me. They give me bread. I like to eat them, and I go quack. You know, I'm a duck. You, you know, you considering that this is a De Niro podcast. What you should have done is, you didn't get me down cold. You didn't get me down. I could have, but then again, I couldn't find the cabbage. Oh. <laughs> Those cabbages. Um, yeah, yeah. So Robert De Niro. Rubber Nero is the topic tonight because we're recording on uh, the 22nd of January, which is a Friday, which is the debut of Dirty Grandpa, his latest film, which is a freaking road trip movie with Zac Efron, and he's dirty as can be. Mm-hmm. Well, so we'll talk about this aging star, and first up, we'll start with James Sullivan. What is your choice pick for the first movie of discussion? Well, um, my first my first film, actually that I that I wanted to talk about was uh, I guess something that's uh, considerably off the radar now, tar- starring uh, starring two great actors, uh, Robert De Niro alongside Robin Williams. I am talking about the uh, uh, the nineteen ninety film Awakenings. Uh, who here is her, who is here has actually heard of that one? No, Matt. 
No? No, no. Mike, no? No, no, no. Nobody nope. knows about Awakenings. Okay, well, nope. I guess uh, I guess this makes me the, the, the pro here. Um, Awakenings is a drama about, um, it's, it's a true story about a doctor who, uh, uh, who begins work at this, at this, uh, at this certain clinic where all the, all the patients at the clinic suffer from a certain, uh, type of catharsis. Um, uh, it's, a. Uh, it, I forget the name of it. I saw this movie just last year, and I was kind of wondering uh, why I'd never heard of this before. Because as a as a drama and as a feel good movie altogether, it really is pretty solid. Um, Robert De Niro uh, is uh, is playing uh, one of the one of the patients at this uh, at this clinic. And Robin Williams is playing the doctor who uh, who starts work at the clinic trying to to figure out what kind of medication to give the the patients to cure them of their condition and it is like I said uh, earlier based on a true story um, the uh, uh, the uh, I, the plot goes that um, Williams's character, um, I forget, I forget his name right now. But, Malcolm uh, Malcolm Sayer. Mal Doctor Malcolm Sayer, yes. Uh, decides to experiment with this uh, this new miracle drug that's uh, that's supposed to uh, bridge the gap in the in the patient's brains that's been severed by this condition, and it. Um, it uh, let's just say it, it starts to show some progress, some major progress, like too good to be true progress. Um, this this drug wakes uh, Robert De Niro and the rest of the uh, the rest of the patients out of their out of their state of you know not being there, and. Uh, it um, it it sort of is an interesting look at uh, De Niro's acting acting range here. We 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 have known De Niro as a, a tough guy actor or a mafia movie actor or whatnot, and this movie is uh, is is showing two extremes in one character. Like I said, he's he's cathartic for for part of the time. So he has to he has to James be completely still. Oh. Oh, okay. I thought the con oh, I thought somehow the the connection broke. And so you you do get like this the this really strong sense that he's playing someone who's not there and they they do tell a lot of this guy's story from when he was a child when he's slipping into the state and uh when he's uh when he comes out of it i'm I'm actually questioning i I actually question some of the legitimacy of the of the portrayal of events in the film because one uh clinically speaking when when people come out of comas or cathartic states typically they uh they suffer from muscular atrophy of some sort um when de niro comes out of his uh his state he's just sort of he's 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 not completely there that, but they sort of skim over any sense that he might have had atrophy, and the other thing that they that they twisted for the film was, in, in, um, in the actual uh, case that was performed by Doctor Doctor Sayer back in the sixties, he uh, uh, he did 
he did what every scientist, doctor, and what have you is actually supposed to do, and created a control group versus, uh, versus uh, the other group. Which you know, what what you have is essentially two groups. Uh, you give one group the placebo, uh, placebo uh, pill, and the other group is you give them the real pill, and you see which ones you see which ones show progress. That's that's what you're supposed to do, and that's what they did. In the film, though, they just uh, they try it on De Niro, it works, and then they say, "Let's give it to all the patients and see if it works for all the patients." And they all start, they all start waking up, and it's kind of, it, 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 it's kind of a too good to be true little moment. But it kind of, it, it kind of watch watching this. Um, I liked seeing De Niro portray someone who couldn't, uh, who couldn't move, who couldn't show any signs that he was there, just to just all of a sudden, being. <sighs> Completely, completely alert, completely physical, walking around. It's, it, uh, I thought, um, I thought that he should have, uh, I, I was looking at the awards for this film and I noticed he, he got nominated for an Oscar and mm -hmm. yeah, this got nominated for three Oscars from what I could see. He, well, one for De Niro, best writing and for best picture. Yep, and unfortunately, I I have to bring this up. Uh, I have to bring this theory up. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Tropic Thunder, but um, oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so you probably know what what I'm gonna say here. Um. Uh, perhaps perhaps De Niro didn't get the reward did get the award here because he went quote unquote full retard but that uh, uh, that that doesn't matter you know I, I still think that he did a good I still think he it did a good job portraying uh, this character and I, and I was also pleased with the with the side cast because they show they actually kind of show different different perspectives on on waking up after after being pretty much a vegetable you know most of the patients are most of the, most of the patients are happy you know if you, if you hadn't been moving for a long time and suddenly you, you had the ability to move again that would be great i mean you have the ability to be to be conscious uh and then there's a case of one particular guy who says well you know what i would have rather I would have rather stayed a, a vegetable because I woke up. I woke up with this medication to the realization that my wife divorced me and my kids are are off living in another state, all grown up, and I never got to see them grow up. So it's kind of like, okay, okay, wow. It sort of gives you the 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 thought that well, should should. Should this sort of medication be tested or not? And I, I think uh, I, I would. I, of course, being who I am, lean more towards the case of it should. But um, I, I just thought this was a an underrated movie. This is what Patch Adams should have been. No, instead of just uh, trying to take a story of someone's life and turn it, turn it into a. a a bad comedy here they they just play it up for a for being a, a feel-good drama I think it's rather I think it's rather underrated oh, but the other amusing thing that I found about it was actually when I rented it and I was telling Mike the story uh, oh it, it's not a problem with the movie itself. <laughs> it's the DVD. It was the DVD. I okay. You've got you've got two actors here that are at the top of their game: Robin Williams and Robert De Niro, in an Academy Award nominated performance. 
and it's coming to DVD for the first time. Even though not too many people have heard of it, so what do you do? Um, my goodness, it's uh, it's it it was one of the worst uh, looking DVD covers I'd ever seen. Um, I I can't show it to you guys right now because I'm I'm recording this, but I am I am dragging the the screen recording up to up to uh up in front of the I, I'm Gret I'm showing the image right in front of the the screen recording here and uh, yeah this is uh, this is pretty bad I don't know how good you guys are gonna get a, a look at it but um, I don't know we got nothing so far yeah well Mike's gonna see the video recording hopefully <laughs> but well, basically I, maybe uh, I'll look it up hold on yeah, basically, what this looks like is they they took um, it. It looks like they they took. Uh, oh, I think I found it. Screen I captures. Think I know exactly what you mean. They took screen captures from the film. It looks like, and they they just blew them up as like they were a really low res image. And uh, it it's kind of a shame, really. Is it the one like we see both Robin Williams and Robert De Niro both together just smiling? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I found it. It looks like they're posing for like this Laurel and Hardy comedic duo thing. It, and the whole deal that you see at the bottom with the with the lake. I don't know where they got that cuz I don't remember that in the film. Well, from what I can tell, keep showing that in posters and stuff like that. Like when you go on, uh, like on IMDb, the official poster it uses is with that lake. Um, yeah, yeah, it's on every little thing. Yeah, uh, so it gets even better though. Once we once we get past the DVD cover, I actually get onto the DVD menu, and. <laughs> Even if a even if a movie's older, sometimes they'll have a they'll have a theme going on, a, a color scheme, some sort of design. This is one of those mod looking DVDs where they just had the Paramount logo on repeat in the background with the basic play play movie chapter trailer, no bonus features, no effort, no nothing put under this. That's terrible. And just this little this copy of the little poster in the in the corner and I'm like it, uh, they they gave this movie the shaft when it came to to treatment I mean and it, it honestly does not deserve it I think it deserves to be I think it deserves to be sort of this uh, this uh, undiscovered gem I, I think it deserves more attention and I that's all imagine. I, huh? No, 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 no. Go on, go on. And that's all I really had to say about it. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Considering that it is like nominated for best picture, it's surprising that um, nobody really mentions a lot about this, and especially if it's one of Robert De Niro's uh, Oscar-nominated performances, like. Like I, I, I'm a little surprised it didn't get at least like some sort of mention. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I was debating on, on what films to watch. I mean, Robert Day was a legend in the industry. He's done so he's done so many iconic ones. You you got your Taxi Driver, you got your Goodfellas, your Casino, um, your Cape Fears, your um, Heat, you have so many to choose from and i was like okay i was looking through the, the filmography and i was like seeing what a, a trend that he was doing and i found two films with a similar kind of theme to it um so i <laughs> didn't have no time so i only watched this fully today uh i i watched a movie called true confessions True confes 
confessions. Oh my god. Okay. And it's as weird a, how... As opposed to uh, the untrue sort? <laughs> it, it, it's gotta be true, alright? It's gotta be true, man. Um, th- okay. And it's weird how this film and the other film are, are like period pieces. These are period pieces, you know, because this film takes place after World War II in the 1940s in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, you have Robert De Niro playing a priest. Mm. Oh. Um and he's brothers with another Robert known as Robert Duvall. So you got Robert and Robert. You got Robert and Robert playing brothers. And they had to make sure they market it as starring Robert Duvall and Robert De Niro so they don't get confused. And if they included Robert Redford, it would be Robert Cubed. <laughs> um... This took me a while to process because this, it this is based on a book, um, of the same name. It's kind of loosely based on the um, uh, the Black Dali, Dali Black Dali murder case. On oh, the Black Dali murder case, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of loosely based on that. So that's where the book came from. It's the author who wrote the book, also uh, authors of the book, also wrote the screenplay. I I might go check out the book because this film is it, it's interesting enough because it's set in, like I said, the 1940s. You got Robert Duvall playing a, of course, a police officer. You know, he's got to solve these crimes here and there, and there's murders popping around. You know, you got. Uh, a guy in the, uh, a priest in a bed who's dead, not Robert uh, De Niro. You have a chick with a rose tattoo that is split in half or s- split in two, which is, I think it's a decapitation actually, um, which is, I was like in 1940, goddamn. And then you got this other murder that happens and it was, it's a big gruesome reveal at the end. But it's like a, you kind of figure out who it's like a murder kind of mystery thing. But Robert Nero is a supporting role, more or less. Like this, supporting roles are kind of interesting for actors. Like they don't do much; they just support the main actor, and the main actor is Robert Duvall. So Robert De Niro is, you know, the priest. You know, he's doing his thing. He's when acting, he's more calm. He's he's more. Like he's not more uptight. He's like more relaxed. He's like you know what a priest should act like. You know, not like uptight or loud. He's just so quiet. You know, it's it's a very it's a he does a, he does a great job at it. It's like the just the the rel, the brothership between uh, Duvall and De Niro is actually quite nice. Actually, if they have a great ke- chemistry between each other, there's um it's really nice, and it's weird because it's. Uh, said in the 1940s there's a kind of hints to the era because there's a scene there in the car and normally you see you know if they're driving in the car you see them you know driving the car like in real life but they do the old technique of you know getting in, into the car and you see the projector kind of thing in the background like as they drive oh rear projection yeah the rear projection kind of thing Instead of green screen, I guess. I don't think it was 1981, so I don't think they kind of had that really going. But yeah, I was watching the scene. I was like, is that rear projection going? Are they actually filming this scene in rear projection with the. the, the? It was like, that was pretty cool. Otherwise, um, like, De Niro's character is involved with this construction tycoon, and it's like he's corrupted. And De Niro tries to help him out, and he's kind of like on the bad side, more or less. Like it's it's hinted at, but it's like I'm like I said, I'm I was trying to comprehend what the plot was and how he was involved, and like it takes a couple of watches to understand. Probably read the book to better understand it, but it's it's just a very dramatic role. It's not something. It's it's just a quiet, you know, relaxing role. You don't see him. Mile, can't you kind of see him worried a couple of times? You know the facial expressions like that, but it's it was actually quite nice to see him. You know, showing his acting chops. You know, it might it could have been like an Oscar contender, possibly. You know, you never knew. Um, 
When does De Niro not act? <laughs> you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, uh, fuck. How do I? Sp- I'm talking about you know how. Um, God damn. I was referring to how you know it's more like a subtle you know quiet role. It's not like this big. You know, like James said, it was like a, a mobster or a gangster role. He's typecast as that as a lot, but this is like a a, a a character that's you know very subtle and submissive. Um, there, there's one time where he yelled, but that was at his brother because <laughs> there's one scene, a <laughs> Robert Duvall, he's like angry at the uh, the construction tycoon who's like corrupted, and. They get into like this little brawl. Like he takes a bottle, smashes the guy in the head, and he's like, "Hey, hey, hey!" And then Robert De Niro has to, like this take his brother back. It's like, "No, no, don't fight him." It's just, but it's just the chemistry between the two Roberts is good, and the story. You know, if you like the period pieces of 1940s, you know, World War II kind of thing, you know, LA stuff, LA, LA noir kind of thing, maybe. Mm-hmm. It's 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 an interesting thing to watch. Yeah, this is before Heat and all that. Yeah, this was nineteen eighty one. This was eighty one. This is right, just right after Raging Bull. Mm. So this um, is this was the film that they that they were basically trying to follow up Raging Bull with. Possibly, possibly. I mean. I mean, Robert De Niro chose his roles. You know, he's like, okay, hmm, I did Raging Bull. I got the Oscar for that. Um, how about, let's see, what, what should I do next? Uh, uh, yes, I'll play a priest, you know, in this quiet little drama, you know, full of not-so-quiet murders. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I didn't know it was based on a book, so I might pick up the book, actually, to read it and see how it fares. Like, it's, it, it, it's a story I like to invest in more. Oh, okay. Would you recommend it? I would. If you want to see, you know, Robert De Niro being this straight up priest, you know, he has like in the movie, he, you know, he's in church. He's does the typical priest things. He, he even has a, uh, a religious show on the radio. Oh, nice. <laughs> Which is, I was like, wait, he's on the radio. That was weird. <laughs> Who listens so, to the radio anymore? And it, and from, from the watch, when I started watching, I was like, wait, I had to look at it for a while. Cause I was like, what era is this? So I was like, eyeballing the cars, eye, eyeballing everything. There was like, I was like, is this the fifties, the forties? And then once somebody said after the war, I was like, oh, it's the 1940s. Um, but the, the, the 40s movie is fifties, it's usually the forties. But the stru- the film I like to say is structured uh, a little bit. The middle part portion is basically like in the forties, but the book ends, the beginning and the end are like in the sixties where they are old. So yes, you see both Duvall and De Niro in old people makeup. They they make them old. You know, he's got the wrinkles and he's got the gray hair and, and Duvall's hair is all slicked back. And I think De Niro's hair was just all sticking up a little bit, you know, old. And, you know, that I think one of his first lines, um, you realize that his character is dying. Like, you know, he has been through all this over the years and he's dying. So he's like, that's why they they connect me for the first time over the years like this is what happened and then they're retelling they're telling the story of how their relationship was and it's a like it's a it's a brother movie it's a it's a brother movie and you, something you should actually just you know check out okay hmm. all right all right sounds interesting and then you have one of the most Oh, no, no, actually, Mike, no, 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 I'll, let me just start this one off. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want, uh, I, yeah, I didn't want to say anything, because I, I should have let you I want to say, because that one you're talking about, I want to save for last. Okay. Uh, for a good reason. Um, now, the one that I want to talk about, here's an interesting fact about Robert De Niro. Very rarely do you ever see him reprise a role, because when you when you look at his, like, 
uh, filmography and stuff like that, you'll notice that there are barely a single, like, there's barely a follow-up that he does where he reprised his role. But there is one re- one exception, and that is his role as Jack Brines, and I'm not going to talk about Meet the Parents, I'm talking about Meet the Fockers. Mm. Now, Meet the Fockers, now I'm going to be honest with this one, is the one that I preferred the most. Like, I've seen Meet the Parents, I did not enjoy it, but Meet the Fockers, I actually did. So, it's Meet a follow-up what? to... What? Meet the what? Fockers. Okay, just checking. Hey, I hey, I got a sore throat, so maybe I'm, I might slip up, okay? Uh, anyways, uh, with this movie, you got... So, it, it's pretty much um, like Ben Stiller and uh, I believe... Uh, Ah, uh, crap. What? Yeah, and uh, Terry Polo's character, like, they're getting, I, I believe they're getting married and stuff like that, but now, they like, they've are like, Ben Stiller already meets, uh, the like, the Brines family, but now, it's, uh, now we're going to meet the Gaylord family, well, the Gaylord Fokker family, which features, um, uh, which actually has Dustin Hoffman and Barbara Streisand, and like they're kind of the more like <laughs> and out there kind of family, and uh, like and and like I guess like the shenanigans kind of right itself, where like you got the you know the really straightforward, full on serious uh, like Robert De Niro and his wife with Blythe, Blythe Danner, where Robert De Niro plays the uh, retired FBI cop that like refuses to quit his job because of uh, Ben Stiller. Mm-hmm. And um, I got to say, there is a bit of a comedic... Like, I noticed there is a major difference between Meet the Fockers and Meet the Parents, where, where Meet the Fockers actually works out more than Meet the Parents. Now, I can understand why people might not like the sequel, but here's the thing. Mm-hmm. In the first one... Like it's it's kind of the same thing. You got the same comedic tempo and stuff like that. But uh, Meet the Parents is freaking brutal. Like the punchlines are, well, let's just say they're a bit literal and stuff like that. Like they can be fierce with their jokes. I remember one of them. It's like one of the jokes is that they're playing like water, like water volleyball, and then suddenly Ben Stiller hits it so hard he like knocks out one of the uh, one of the people's noses to the point that it's like bleeding profusely. It's like I feel like they were taking it too far with the jokes, but with wait, Meet the Fuck, what? Wait, wait, you mean the first, the first one? Yeah, the first one. But in Meet the Fockers, um. The, they decide to go with a more perverted route where the jokes are more related with like boobs and stuff like boobs and butts and stuff like that. And My like favorite lot, stuff right there, boobs and butts. <laughs> like there's a lot more sex jokes, jokes, especially like with Barbara Streisand's character. She's like the more hippie, like she's more hippie style mom, and she practices like she teaches uh, she teaches sex yoga to elderly people and Dustin Hoffman is more like the wild guy out there and like they're more perverted but in contrast to meet the parents they're more tame Mm -hmm. so like they don't really go too so like in a way they don't really go too far with it where meet the parents is more about the violence uh, meet meet the Fockers is more about the more about the nudity and then you got little fuckers. That's all about the stupidity. <laughs> yeah. So what you're saying is that uh, Ben Stiller's baby foreskin wasn't too much for you. That wasn't yeah. too extreme. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot about that one. Oh, yeah, man. it's it's in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. They Look dropped it in someone's drink. <laughs> oh yeah. I thought it was in fondue. Yeah, I thought it was a soup. Ah, whatever. It, it, it was a punchline with foreskin, and you don't want to know where it landed. Uh, kind of like in the first movie, where the punchline was with uh, De Niro's mother's ashes. Oh, yes. Uh, I, 
Yeah, I I can see why I I can see why you might prefer the the comedic tones of one over the other. And I notice a lot of people a, a lot of people do do sort of gravitate towards the meet the fuckers because I, I guess be, because it uh, they, they've got a, a a bigger celebrity uh Roster. selection there i mean dustin hoppin barbara streisand hadn't worked on anything in five years but who needs her anyway uh sorry about that um with with the uh the original film i i i i sort of thought that that was in my case just just good enough um but it but I have to say, I have to say, it's it's guess who's coming to dinner? Uh, it's father of the bride. It's monster in law. It's all it's all of those it's all of those types of movies where you have uh, where you have uh, the parents the parent that doesn't that just doesn't want to give their their adult son or daughter away to somebody else and that's that that's fine you know the the formula works to a to a degree but with when it comes to meet the fockers it seems like they were it seems like they were remaking that conflict over again and then i didn't even go see little fockers because i was like okay are we doing this again by that point it's like okay de niro's gonna come in and say uh Still, Ben Stiller's character, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I don't like you so much for whatever reason. I'm gonna be a hard ass on you, and then I'm gonna come around, turn around at the end of the movie, and be a nice guy because hey, I've been an asshole this whole time. Uh. I, I felt like with Meet the Fockers, it was, it, it was starting to get a little bit repetitive. Ah, uh, that's true, but. You know, most sequels tend to do that. They retrend the original. You know, they tend to do that in general. But God, it's been a while since I've seen the movies because I own all three of them on DVD. Actually, mm. um, oh, it's been a while, and I'm actually having these like non-flashbacks. Actually, seeing those scenes, um, especially the kid, kid saying "asshole." Oh yeah, yeah, definitely and one it's of the a- more popular ones. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just realized that it's a DreamWorks picture too. Ah, uh, yes. It's funny because one of the trivia facts was, uh, uh, Baby LJ says "asshole" nine times, the most said from a minor in a DreamWorks film. <laughs> it's like, wait, really? What? It's just a They're kid. They're keeping count. I guess. Oh, so sitting out the count. there with a with a check pad, saying, "Okay." <laughs> Asshole. The same person that would count the amount of F words said in every angry video game nerd episode. Uh, well, whoever that is, they can sit through our Samuel L. Jackson podcast and <laughs> Exactly. Actually yeah. you should you should recount that because I might have miscounted for that one. Oh but yeah. I didn't even think of that. Sorry. Yeah, I uh, I think I think I try to count it out exactly, but uh, Meet the Fockers is actually the superior one in the trilogy. Actually, you think so? I get, I, I agree with Matt actually because Meet the Parents was the standard fluff. You know, that's like, ooh, uh, I mean, your parents for the first time. That's what you do when you're dating someone. You meet the parents and for the first time, and something happens. Usually, you know, the conversations happens. You know, but with Meet the Fockers. Uh, Dustin Hoffman, I think, does it for me. Like Dustin Hoffman's character, mm-hmm. just <laughs> just makes me grin a big fat smile. I mean, Barbara Streisand too. It was just like she it was like so raunchy, and I was like, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm more like it's weird because I remember it too because it was spoofed later on in the movie Date Movie, very heavenly. Oh. Yes, I. It, it I, was it, it it was desperately spoofed. Yes, in, it was a date movie. It was, 
it was like the oh, yeah. main main like main spoof they're doing like, like the main storyline for date movie which i remember so finally but it was just but as a, i mean it's, it's like the basketball scene go no because that was along came Polly. never mind oh now why am i going to date? get the fuck out of the date movie okay meet the fuckers <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry i tend to because sometimes movies cross gen because when you spoof a movie it goes ah fucking but meet the fuckers was like one of my favorites yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we have a mix of opinions here, you know. Yeah, and that's totally fine. I mean, uh-huh. I, I, you know, I wonder. I don't know. I, they, because little fuckers was just interesting. Where they had little kids. Fuck, fuckers, fuck. Fockers. What? So what? It's the, it's the, MPA, the MPAA was just like all over that. It was like, ah, we can't have that title. We got to fix the title and the spelling of it. Yeah. It, at that point, you know, your, you know, your, your movies trying to get uh, the, the jokes overplayed, you know? Uh-huh. In case you haven't guessed, the joke is at this point, Fokker. Fucker, fucker, fucker. <laughs> but Robert De Niro's character in the trilogy alone was um, interesting enough because he's a retired FBI agent. And he was this. Or they, is like, they, he? like, they they hinted at that because, you know, meet the parents, you know, the first movie they had his secret room in the house. You know, he's got the lie detector all set up and crap and just. It's a very hush hush kind of thing. I thought that was something fresh, you know, the the lie detector and everything. Yeah, it was. Yeah, a t- <laughs> you hadn't seen anything quite like that in a in a in a guess who type of type of story. Well, yeah, because he's because he's the stern father. He's like the uh-huh. one that's you know. Like very stuck first, up, very yeah, serious. St- yeah, stuck up, serious. You know, not sh- unsure about uh, Gaylord, Greg mm-hmm. Fokker. God, it's, 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 it's weird because I'm trying to remember the movie, and it's slowly playing in my head. And it's just like what m- moments pop out the most. I mean, you got the the foreskin, you got the asshole, you got the uh, freaking Barbara Streisand sex therapy. Um, I'd forgotten about that. I wonder why. <laughs> it's it's if you haven't watched it, you know, in a long time, it is kind of forgettable. But there's those moments that stick out the most. It's like uh-huh. the, nobody ever talks about the meet the the meet the trilogy, as I call it, yeah, or the, the Fokker trilogy. trilogy. Agreeably, not the the highlight of Robert De Niro <laughs> here, but still interesting to mention how. It's the only one where he played like the same role again and again. Yeah, he, I think he produced him as well, so he had hands on the project too for all three films. Uh, he probably had something in his contract. He said, "Okay, I'm working for DreamWorks. I got to do this in Shark Tale." <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not forgetting that one. Oh dear. <laughs> He was in Shark Tale. Good God! Where like he played the Robert De Niro shark. Yeah, that's basically you know the typical Mark. See, that's the thing. Like, um, Robert De Niro and Mar- Mar- Martin Scorsese are like the biggest you know collaborators together. Like they they even know each other since childhood. Like I like I was reading up where they were actually you know blocks apart from each other, and then once they met at a party you know, as kids, you know. So they knew each other for a long time. The childhood friends. So That's a long time. It is. It was I was surprised to read that. I was like, <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. I like and you know, the Martin Scorsese Martin Sor- Scorsese kind of, that last one fucks me up too much. Um Scorsese. You take that too and you take your Margot Robbies and Margot Robos. <laughs> I'll take Name a margarita, butch. actually. <laughs> no margaritas for you, Miss Idy. Do you do? I'd be drunk. 
Um, so his rules are kind of, you know, he's typecast as these mobster gangster rules uh-huh. a lot. So it's fresh to see him doing like the stern father a couple of times or you doing something, you know, a quiet role like a priest or something, you know. Um, oh, and speaking of fathers. Speaking of stern fathers, I should say. Uh, Is he a stern father and everybody's fine? Yeah. Here's another one we. Uh, here's another one that I picked that's a bit off the radar here, but um, it's more recent from 2009. We have everybody's. Everybody's fine. He plays a, a guy by the name of Frank Good. And uh, I I just noticed all the I, I I can't help but notice all of the irony already in play. The story is um, good. Yes, I I know. Like this may sound like a really bad joke, but does he have a son? That did, did when he has a son, did he call him Git? Get good. <laughs> Get good. <laughs> Sorry, that was stupid of me, but I, I just had to. No, actually, he has two sons and two daughters. And the and get good the and be good. And they're all and they're all grown up. And the character that he plays, Frank, has been a widower for uh, about eight months up until this point. But uh, the the problem that he's facing, the dilemma, is that. Um, is that he? Uh, uh, he was supposed to meet up with his with his adult kids one uh, uh, this this one weekend, and um, they all of them up and canceled on him. So, uh, what does he do? Uh, he go. Uh, he goes. He goes ahead and decides to surprise his kids with a road trip where he where he's uh, visiting them all across the US where you know, all in the different locations that they're that they're living at and uh, uh, he's not supposed to do this his doctor says uh, you know you've uh, you've got this medication that you need to you need to stick to yeah he, he had some sort of condition in the film I forget what it was but it was pretty nasty and um i i guess the irony is in the title everybody's fine because uh it it's the kind of thing when you say uh it it's the kind of thing that you say really when someone's uh asking you when a longtime friend comes up to you and says Oh, okay. So, so how's the family? And you're like, well, every yeah, the family's fine. Everybody's fine. And you could have, and you could have a whole bunch of shit going on in your family that uh, that um, you don't want to talk about. And uh, that's that's kind of the idea behind this movie is that everybody's not really fine. And. Uh, we start to figure that out more and more as the movie goes on. Um, uh, He's got... uh, Three of his kids are played by known actors, Kate Beckinsale, Sam Rockwell, and Drew Barrymore. And they... And um, there's a fourth... There's a fourth... uh, There's a fourth sibling in there, a character by the name of David, uh who um i don't think is i don't think is played by a known actor or anything at least i didn't recognize him but um he's sort of the main source of conflict as the story goes on um as as frank is traveling from one uh from one uh, offspring to another trying to surprise them all the different siblings are actually on the phone with each other the whole time talking about Frank and they they're saying uh yeah I heard about Frank uh 
there's something happened down in Mexico. I'm not, I'm not so sure what's going on. Uh, but whatever you do, don't tell dad. He's coming your way. And so, yeah, you kind of get the idea that something's up with this, with this fourth sibling that you don't even see. And that, uh, and that's, uh, that's the thing about this is they're, they're able to, they're able to create a conflict around this big surprise. Sp sp sort of a spoiler alert here. When we, when we come to the end of the movie, we find out that David's dead. And this whole this whole time, actually, while they're while they cut out on Robert De Niro's character, they've been trying to figure out what happened to David when he was down in Mexico. And let's just say he was a he overdosed. But it it's not a it's not really a depressing movie. We get to a. Uh, uh, we get to to know all these characters and where they are at the at this point in their life where they're all reaching their middle age and we realize that um okay we we start to piece together early on that something bad happened to david but we don't we don't realize until later that um they all have stuff going on in their lives that they weren't uh, that they weren't willing to share with their dad. And that's, uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting because the kids all say, well, we were able to share, we were able to share this stuff with mom because she was always much more forthcoming and she was always easier to talk to. It's, <laughs> I think uh, with you, it was like, it, we were all, it was, uh, we had to, to really please, we had to really work hard to please you. And I think um, I, I like I like the I like the the film because they all come together and they they all realize that you know what's what's left of their family. It's that they they all need to be honest with each other, and that's the sense that the that the movie leaves leaves off on how oh, Frank does become Frank becomes a better person because he starts he starts to realize a lot of things about himself that um, that he didn't realize while he was being their father for once for one he he's one of those parents who still views his kids as being kids you know every whenever he he pays a visit to each one of them. He takes a look at them, and there's there's one moment where the shot changes over, and he sees them at age ten or something. I see, and uh, and so he's he says to himself at the end of the film, "I need to I need to be a better person here. I'm retired. I need to stop." Uh, viewing my kids as being just kids and realize something they they have their own lives now they're adults they need to get on with it they need to figure stuff out for themselves and so yeah I I, I found myself to be really compelled by this movie which didn't get which didn't get very much press Although I did find it on Netflix, so I'd never heard of it before. I don't know about mm -hmm. you guys. No. <laughs> it's weird because as you were describing it, it felt like it was something I watched a long time ago, probably when it came out. Because I remember as you were talking about it, I was like, wait. It's like, oh, I've seen it. It's like, it's been a while since I've seen it, though. So it's just like, it's, I mean, here's the thing. Is it a film? Would you that you want to watch on Christmas every year? Because it's set during Christmas. Well, the well, the climax of the film is set during Christmas, but uh, no, not really. Well, well, some of these. Well, I was reading the reviews because it got like forty-seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so it wasn't forty-seven percent. Yeah, it's not really good. 
Ah, uh, yeah. I think it deserves it deserved higher than that. Come on. Yeah, there was like one review is like, eh, mm, it's it's like one big fluffed up uh, Christmas dramedy. Um, I didn't really feel like a a Christmas dramedy. I wouldn't associate this with Christmas other than the ending. Well, isn't that the usual case with, uh, with with movies that that are released on Christmas? Usually, they just put the Christmas scene at the end. <laughs> Probably. They they have this great scene in the film without giving too too much away. Um, Frank uh, near the end of the movie, uh, he runs out of medication and passes out at one point while he's passed out he has a he has a dream where he's he he's still he's still himself and he's but he's still his older self but he's sitting in his backyard with a with all of his kids at a at a table and they're they're all kids again and he says mm. And he says, yeah, I decided to come home early from work today so I could spend some time with you guys. And he's talking to him like uh, like it was 30 years ago when they were all kids and everything was happy. And then he stops and he says, I just have one question. I went out of my way to come see you guys and why did you all lie to me? And he suddenly starts talking to all these all these kids like they're adults and he says... Uh, you, Amy, you didn't tell me that. Da 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 da. Why are you acting like everything's normal at your house? And you, and you, and you, and he he's talking to the he's talking to his kids like suddenly they're adults again, and that's it, it's it's very surreal. <laughs> but it feels like you get a a sense of. A, a sense of that his character is is actually is actually maturing, and I I kind of that's why I don't feel like it's it's a fluff piece. Uh, it's, it's what I read, and that's uh, people have their own opinions, but I digress. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's all I really had to say about it. Except, oh yeah. Third time that uh, Sam Rockwell and Drew Barrymore were in a film together. Ooh. I wonder if there's a connection. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. I don't know. Um, so, all right. Like I said before, I tried to watch something. I tried. I, I, I did it last minute, all right? I confess, I did it at... This is my true confession. I did it last minute. I'm a. I did it. I procrastinated on watching films. All right. You watch m- something. It's your damn show, Mike. It's just I've been. It's like it's a busy life kills you in the back. But uh, who says that? Me, I guess. Um, so, like I said, I I ran with a theme and another film that Robert De Niro did. Uh, I believe eight. Eight years later, eighty nine or nine. Fuck, I get. God, I need to work my math. Um, he did a film in eighty nine called "We're Not Angels." No, he got it right. He got it right. Oh, thank God. <laughs> okay, eight years. Okay, yeah, "We're Not Angels" is a comedy uh, of which, like I said before, is set. Uh, it's a period piece, so it's set in nineteen thirty five. Mm-hmm. Um, basically it's, you know, you got Robert De Niro and you got Sean Penn as convicts. They're in jail and they're with this one killer, you know, they get connected together, you know, and they escape, they escape the jail and they're on the, uh, they're in a New York city, New York, a New York city on the border of Canada, which is, they're trying to escape by crossing the border. So, but, uh-oh, they get recognized as priests. So he, he becomes a priest again. 
<laughs> but this time in a comedic role, like his character in this film is he's more like like I said, Sean Penn and um, Robert De Niro. Sean Penn plays probably like you know, and during the eighties, he did did the um, fast fast times kind of thing where he's like the surfer dude, but this time he's like the dumb dim witted counterpart of the duo. Mm-hmm. Um, then he, Robert De Niro is of course playing the typecast of what he's always been playing over the years, which is like the um, criminal, you know, gangster mobster sort of thing. It's like more like a criminal role. Like he's like, uh, like a New Yorker kind of, you know, a, hey, um, you know what the fuck's going on here, man? It's like fuck you, man. And it's like I, I'm a fucking priest. You know that I'm a fucking priest. That's what that's what I am. Um, I can't. It's it, like I said. I, I try to scan through it as much as I can. But the cast looks actually pretty interesting because besides those two, you have Demi Moore in it. You have a young jo- you, you have a young jo- John C. Riley in it. Um. Oh wow. Oh. Um, you got Wallace Shaw. Sean. Yeah, Sean. It's it's yeah, Wallace 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 Wallace. He plays a translator, so he's just like translating one priest because because they because these two get accepted at a monastery, and it's just like they try to act like they're priests, and they're like priests and they just try to you know sing along or reading passages and it's just like it's it's a oh boy hijinks and sue mm-hmm. <laughs> can i sort of make up this melody as i go along because that's always funny right yeah it's like how long can we kick up a shtick until we escape it's I mean, from what I've seen, it's just that's what it is. I mean, there there is a happy ending, as I read up. It's just, you know, they do escape eventually. It's just, it's, but it's, I just like they, he played a priest twice. It's just like, but it's like dramatic versus comedic, and it's just, you know, what have you. I mean, if you want to see a, a comedy film made in '89 with Robert De Niro playing, you know, the sh- sticky, sh- schlocky stuff he usually does. With Sean Penn being the the dim-witted guy, and, and the, the cast is amazing. Come on, you gotta see it just to see a, a young priest being played by John C. Riley, Demi Moore. Oh my God, Demi Moore! <laughs> and and no, Wall- Demi Moore, even yeah. better. And and Wallace, you know, he's always great in anything he does. Uh, it's just that. Like I said, I haven't watched the whole film. I just got a glimpse of it. That's pretty much it because I'm. I did that because we have about. Give me a second. Oh, half an hour, much, not bad. Much time left, so Mr. Matt Brunet can talk about the other sequel. Mm-hmm. Yes, despite not appearing in the first, he does play a very well known role, and some may argue that this could be. His probably maybe his crown jewel performance, and I am referring to, of course, The Godfather Part Two. And this, I actually watched this yesterday, considering, like I was like since I was sick, like I decided, eh, you know what, I'm gonna turn off my body and I'm gonna watch three and a half hours worth of freaking Godfather Part Two. And I just want to mention at the start that. Um, I've seen the first Godfather so many times. In fact, when I was in college, uh, I had to study this from top to bottom. It, well, like I had to study this twice. Once to analyze the cinematic aspect of the movie, and a second time to study the character of Michael Corleone, and also uh, Vito Corleone as well. Now, when you got the sequel... Ah, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you got the sequel, this is more of a story of the rise and fall of someone. When you see someone doing it right, and you see someone doing it wrong. First, you got Michael's side of the story, who wants to expand his empire, uh, trying to trying to like take over like the entirety of Nevada, uh, another play, uh, Lake Tahoe, and also he wants to conquer Cuba. Like, he wants to have all those under the Corleone regime. However, while he's doing that, 
everything around him just pretty much crumbles where it's down to the point that even his family is starting to turn against him. But then we have another story where it also decides, well, not all the time, but sometimes focus on the uh, story of Vito Corleone, which you remember is the first godfather. And this is where we bring in Robert De Niro and we see his complete origins from when he was a little kid back in 1901, uh, where he completely lost his family and he went to, um, he decided to go to New York as an immigrant. And he pretty much wanted to go and climb up the ranks from there where he was pretty much the first person to stand up from the other like dons that were there like when he was in his um when he was in his home in new york in new york like there's this one guy who was taking over everything and even his uh his nephew took over uh his job so he decided like and he kind of messed around with him by stealing stuff and he decided you know what instead of paying him like what we owe and stuff like that. Why don't we just kill him? You know, like why yeah. don't yeah, just why not? assassinate him. And so he decided, like he he decided to start out by trying to do that. And then you see, um, he started doing favors for other people among the community. Like he, like it, you start to see like his reputation growing and stuff like that. Where like you see why he's becoming a godfather. And finally. Um, what pretty much end, ends up in his story is that Robert De Niro comes face to face with the Don that killed his entire family and finally having his revenge, which is actually really interesting because when the movie starts, you see the mom trying to ask that Don to spare uh, Vito because like, she's trying to say, it's like, oh, he's, he won't do anything. He's too stupid. He's too simple minded to, to, to harm anyone. And like, that Don knew that that Don knew before anyone else that he will grow up that he would grow up to be someone fully serious. Mm-hmm. And um, but yeah, like so that's pretty much the entirety of Robert De Niro's part. But it's really I need to see this again in order to fully comprehend um, Michael Corleone's aspect because like there are so many things happening that like um like so many betrayals and stuff like that and um often like sometimes i would end up being a little bit confused knowing like whose side is michael on like who is he supporting like which person is he supporting either if it's um like uh pentageli or if it's uh uh hyman roth like so, sometimes, like you'd be a little bit confused, like who does he want, like who is he supporting and stuff like that, in order to grow his regime. But um, it really is dramatic to see, like maybe it's a bit of a spoiler, but like how his, like some of his family turns against against him. You don't mind if I spoil here about like what happened and stuff? You guys seen uh, the movie? I've seen the movie. Yeah, the fact okay. that like one of the main plots is pretty much Michael trying to figure out who tried to assassinate him and like sometimes we see like he's been accusing left and right saying that it's Pentageli and then it was Hyman Roth but he knew for a fact it was freaking Fredo that it was his own older brother because he because Fredo is so sick and tired being bossed around by his little by his little brother it makes no sense to him and also Oh my god, but the most dramatic part is with Kay. My god, like where he's so anticipating with his son and then he heard it was a miscarriage, but in actuality, she wants all this to end, so it was an actual abortion as a way mm. for her to stop Michael's regime. It was crazy. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Oh yeah. Trust me, I, it's, it's it's a series of nothing but backstabs to Michael. And that's how I see, like, where things go downhill for Michael and you see things uphill for Vito because he knows how to build up his family, like how he build up his power and to gain respect and stuff like that. While Michael is pretty much losing that power, like he's losing his connection with his family. He's losing, you know, his, uh, like he's losing his faith and trust with everyone in order to gain more power for the Corleone name. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think the... I, I've seen the first two Godfather films, <sighs> and... Uh, and and while I, I I still sort of think the first one is better, um, with the uh, with with the first two films, they they have a certain strength, and that is that is this they they show two alternating stories going, and and. Uh, these two stories of these two individuals are somehow connected. They're somehow connected, but they, they, uh, while they face a similar or same series of events, um, they, they might have a different outcome. And usually that's because of, uh, usually that's because of character progression. In the, in the case though, with the first Godfather, it's a story about how, older Vito Corleone goes from a bad guy to trying to be a good guy and with his son Michael Corleone he goes from being a good guy to being corrupted with the sequel though it takes that it takes that uh, sort of storytelling gimmick and takes it in the more more the direction of say uh, the first season of Once Upon a Time, where they're jumping back and forth in time, trying to try to tell two stories that have uh, that have similarities to them or connections, and saying this is how this is this is how this story ended up. This is how this story ended up. Which one's a happy ending, <sighs> or as close to a happy ending as you can get? That, and that's why that. That I think shows a lot of strength in in the series as a whole, which is also and it's also why I I get I I've had my issues with the recuts like the Godfather saga because without if, if you're telling everything in chronological order it kind of gets boring. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, it's one of those uh, iconic, you know, films, you know. I think the screenplay of this film is like in a museum somewhere, so it's that that fucking good. Um, yeah, I, I don't care about spoilers, but I have yet to see the Godfather saga, or the f- first two at least. I, I cause <laughs> it's funny enough, because today actually I got there was news of, you know, HBO releasing the seven hour cut of the godfather and i sent the link to james and morgan and everybody else and they're like I- i've seen it already I-, I know what it is and i was like i just thought of you guys that's all god mm-hmm. I'm, that was nice of you to think of us you know just we're like, all friends I mean, I mean i haven't seen it but i was like oh, hey there you go seven hour cut for the people who have not seen the seven hour cut of it i mean <laughs> It's it's just one of those, and it's weird because it's weird because he got the Oscar for this role, and yet, mm-hmm. and it's weird. And it's also really cool that this is the first time that it has been uh, sh- like a shared Oscar sort of win between a character, like Mar- Marlon Brando got the Oscar for the yeah, same that's character. That's true. That's true. It's it's really interesting to think about that. I was like, wow. And I think this is probably the first time that a sequel was nominated for uh, an Oscar. No, to actually win. I, yeah. I think, well, I know, like, it's so far the only sequel that actually won the Oscar. Oscar. Maybe it is also the first to be nominated, but it's more uh, known to be, like, the first yeah. and so far the yeah. only sequel to get the Oscar for Best Picture. It's, it's the, I mean, that's just history, man. It's, like, that's the best of the best. I mean, see, and then... You don't see a lot of sequels in the Oscars, and so it's just like, wow, wow. And so, yeah, I guess um, he doesn't even speak English in the whole film. He speaks uh, Italian Sicilian. Oh, yeah. He speaks a little bit of English. It's like, well, Mari, I can do this. I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I was just reading up because all the research he's been doing, he, he lived in he lived in Sicily for like three months just to get the language down so he could speak and Sicilian. he also ma- 
And then he also married a and then he also married a wife there who unfortunately died because of a car explosion. Oh yes. <laughs> Wait, wrong movie, you fool. <laughs> hey, same saga. Um, it's interesting because yeah, it's not just a sequel; it's actually a prequel too. So it's like it's like an intermix, like James said, it was like an intermix between the being a prequel and a sequel. And so, which is interesting because you don't see a lot of those anymore. It's like it's mostly hmm, sequel, hmm, pre- prequel. But it's 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 nice to marriage those together in a way, especially yeah, if you're telling of a character. Well, that's what happens when you get uh, when you make something like Tokyo Drift. God, don't even, that, that, that freaking, that stupid franchise. Oh, come on, you love that franchise. I know, I'm just saying, it's, just, it's so, I, I love the franchise of Fast and Furious, but that's just, the way they er, intertwine, oh my God, that's a whole different story. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, what's the, uh, Okay, what? here's a better example. Uh, try try making the Saw movies, putting those in chronological order. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. I mean, I think it's coming back with that format because I think I read that the new Die Hard's going to be in that format where they're doing the origin of John McClane and they're just going to intercut with the present. So. So they're uh, they're they're going they're they're dropping the uh, they dro- the plot where he goes to space. Oh, we made that one up. No, there was the plot where they were supposed to go to Tokyo with um, Zeus and his wife, but I get so they're like the yeah, god. It's, what <laughs> Zeus from. Uh, with vengeance, oh. with, with the vengeance, Samuel oh. Jackson. Oh, his, his character's guy. name was Zeus in the film. Uh, you know what? <laughs> Give it. Just let the those movies rest. <laughs> I mean, you could, and it's. I mean, The Godfather's just that one. That that franchise. You just have to. I mean, uh, it's it's iconic, iconic. And it will make you love oranges. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, not really love oranges. You you highly doubt it. Even when I, even after watching it, I was like, you know, for a midnight snack, should I have an orange? No. Afterwards, I would die. <laughs> uh, That's yes. why they call it a blood orange. Ooh. Oh yeah, Robert De Niro. Yes, he's seventy-two. Thank fucking god. I don't know. I'm just we still got him for several years, and he's still got a chance to make good movies. So yeah, he's like I said today or yesterday. Dirty Grandpa came out, and he's got another film coming out this year too. And I. I forgot what that was. It was another film. It was, he did a short film called Ellis, which is about immigration, which was interesting. Um, he's doing a lot more. He's, he's, I've noticed he's been doing a couple with David O. Russell, you know, with like Silver Lion Playbook, uh, Joy. He, he had a bit part in, in a American Hustle. I mean, he's still acting. He's still going at it. Yeah. He's still, yeah, he's still very, uh, very on point. I mean, he's collabed with a lot of people. He's the directors, you know, he's, you know, the iconic, you know, meetup of Al Pacino in a couple of films, you know. Um, he eventually meets up with Marlon Brando once again for the score, uh, which was so weird. they never met. I haven't seen the film yet. I, I thought they have scenes together in the film. I mean, in the, 
I mean, in the Godfather saga, they never actually met. Cause, I know. Uh, I They're the same fucking character. I know that. I'm talking about yeah. a different fucking movie later on in the 2000s. Oh, my God. So. Yes. But but you said they were reunited, and I said, what? since <laughs> well, when? What movie? <laughs> I mean, that's not what I meant. I meant to say fucking... I meant to say they they... You know what I meant. You people at home, you knew what I meant. You knew what I, I meant. I mean, I think so. I mean, they're in the same franchise. You know, it's like, oh yeah, they uh, finally met up. I guess that that that's what I should say. They finally met up. God. Ah. Uh, same case with Heat. Actually, he never actually. He he's got a co he co starred with Al Pacino in Godfather Part Two, but never actually met him in the course of the film. Yeah, yeah. Not until Heat. Yeah, that was. I mean that that they, like that was like the moment like everybody knew everybody was watching De Niro everybody was watching uh, Pacino and they were like wait this is the ultimate thing because everybody because. That's iconic of them to meet up because they're just big actors. Two Godfathers facing mm-hmm. off. Two God, two legendary Godfathers in one movie. Mm-hmm. You just can't beat it sometimes. Um, <laughs> he's producing. That's for sure. He's been producing a lot of films over the years. No, oh, his first. Oh, he first produced were no angels. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, what is he? Did he? Yeah, his upcoming producing credit is actually for a HBO film called The Wizard of Lies. Oh. Mm. We're up to see the wizard. So the same not. thing, basically. Uh huh. Not really. Oh, is it? He's producing and starring in it. Okay. Oh, it's Bernie Madoff. Oh, that's that's that film. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, fire uh, away. <laughs> that would be interesting to see him play Bernie Madoff. Uh, documentaries he's been in. Holy smokes. Uh, he's theater. He's done. Everybody's in theater. Yes. Yeah, so, the the one fact I want to say before anything, the reason why. It, his his epiphany of going to acting was when he played the Cowardly Lion, the Cowardly Lion in the Wizard of Oz as a ten year old. I hope he like, still had that accent. I'm gonna be a actor. I, I can I can see a a ten year old Robert De Niro as a as a Cowardly Lion. Hey. Like, hey. Hey, pull him up, pull him up. You talking to me? Hey. You talking to me? Hey, I'm Rob. Hey, I'm the Cowardly Lion. I'm here to look for my courage. You see me right now? You see me? I'm a scared little crap. So now, I need to go and find myself some courage. Yo, little girl, you think you can help me? You think you can help me? There you go. Oh yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. uh, down, 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 down. Um, All so, right, timer master, how are we doing? Got about like seven minutes left. And we just finish it off early or something. I don't know. We could. I I was thinking about that, but let me. Um. What the fuck was I? Like, I lost my train of thought. Now I can't end it without my train of thought. Way to go! Bye bye. It just disappeared. What was I gonna, there's something I want to say, but I guess, I guess you know, for us, you know, Robert De Niro is always gonna be a legend. We always, we always be watching him. This is a great little nod to him. You know, check out his films. Like if you. Maybe these films. Maybe check he out his filmography. He, he makes, makes good he, stuff. He mm-hmm. makes good. He makes good stuff. Some sometimes, especially if you're talking about Shark Tale. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes there's some hit and misses there. I mean, there's even um, 
that's what I wanted to mention. There was a, a movie I was considering to watch, but it was um, it has C- Philip Seymour Hoffman in it as a drag queen in it. Oh, what is that? No, um, nobody's perfect or something. Every oh, flawless, flawless, flawless. Yeah, I want. I was like watching the trailer for that one. I was like, because because it was a role where Robert De Niro couldn't. Uh, he was playing a person who couldn't uh, uh, talk or sing because he was paralyzed somehow. So he, he gets singing lessons from a drag queen played by freaking Philip Seymour Hoffman. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, we miss you, <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, uh, drugs are bad, okay? Yeah, well... So are drags, but anyway. Uh, next time, I'm trying to double check the schedule because I do have something planned for next time. What do I have planned for next time? What do I have planned for next time? This is a railroad destruction bad worst, epi- worst episode ever. <laughs> um, ah, yes, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. Uh, next up is going to be our 70th episode. Mm. So we've reached 70 episodes n- next time, two weeks from now. Um, we're going to talk about films that are 100% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Because 10 episodes ago, we've talked about 0% films. Why not talk about the 100% films out there? And uh, there's so many out there. We're just, we're just let's, let's just pick one at least. I mean... Maybe two, depending on. I have one film that I probably would talk forever about because it's oh, so mind blowing. <sighs> and you guys would be with me seeing this fucking film. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, one hundred percent fresh films on Rotten Tomatoes. So yeah, this has been Cinema Royale. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, what is your favorite Robert De Niro film performance or what have you? What other aging actors should we check out? Should we do an Al Pacino episode? Leave it in the comments down below. Make sure to give it a like. Also, share it with all your friends, especially those diehard Robert De Niro fans. And uh, subscribe for more episodes like this. And uh, until then, long live cinema and good night. See you, ladies. I'll try Ciao to get better now. for next time. Yes. Make that yeah. make that sore throat your bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of did by being here. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't. His voice is not. His voice was not too bad, wasn't it, guys? Comment below if you like the voice. It's all raspy. Man. All right. Ciao for now. <laughs>